What's up, everyone? Ben with the BTC Sessions here, and this is your daily session. Hodl the Bitcoin. Before we dive into the news, of course, shout out to sponsors of the show, Ledin.io. This is where you can use your Bitcoin for a couple of different services, one of which is Bitcoin-backed loans. You can get Canadian or US dollars using your Bitcoin as collateral, and the second of which is a Bitcoin savings account where you can deposit and receive interest on your Bitcoin paid out in Bitcoin. If you want to check out either of these services, click the link I provide it down below. And if you opt for a loan, they'll actually end up crediting you with an additional $50 worth of Bitcoin into your account. And secondly, if you're already into Bitcoin, then of course, privacy is of the utmost importance. There's a lot of things you can do. One of the things I regularly do is use a VPN. I have this on my computer and my phone. Uh, and what it does is it helps mask your IP address. It helps encrypt your browsing data. And finally, it has the added benefit of being able to unlock geo-blocked content. So if you can't access something because you're not in that country, you can designate that as your home country and access it with ease. So if you want to check that out, there's a link down below. And with the deal that they provide, it will only be about three bucks a month. So pretty solid there. And with that, let's dive into the news. So today is, uh, I see some people referring to it as Bitcoin Independence Day. Uh, This is a big day for Bitcoin. And I think this is one of the days that most solidified the the promise of what Bitcoin hopes to achieve um, in the way that it cannot be subverted by individuals or companies or or you know people's interests outside of what the community wants and um, so UASF what is this user activated soft fork we need to go back a couple years to 2017 and even before then uh when the scaling debate was raging uh how were we to scale the network to allow for more users for cheaper transactions so on and so forth and there is a lot of nuance to the argument that was had here. Some people said, let's just increase the blocks, just allow for more throughput, more more transactions on the on the blockchain. However, with this came a very real trade-off. Would it then become difficult for an individual to run a node like the one I the one I have behind me there that keeps track of the entire Bitcoin blockchain. Would that become more difficult? I mean, with small increases, perhaps not. But if that became a trend, then that could become a worry. Um, So the idea was, and the one that actually ended up winning out for the vast majority of people that are still using Bitcoin today, uh, was that we want to try and keep running a Bitcoin node and self-verifying the transactions, if you choose to do so, as economical as possible. And so we will continue to keep the block size as is, while at the same time optimizing with things like segregated witness, which does a, a, a little trick that allows for more transaction throughput without adding too much size to the blockchain itself. Um, and so... What ended up happening with the user activated soft fork was this. There was something called the New York Agreement. And the New York Agreement was essentially a number of companies and high ranking, I guess, if you can say so, individuals in those companies getting together and deciding we are going to do a hard fork of Bitcoin and create two megabyte blocks to allow further throughput, as well as implement something called SegWit. Now, SegWit already had, uh, you know, more or less support across the entire community, but some people wanted this two megabyte increase as well, which would have been a hard fork, a non-backwards compatible upgrade to the Bitcoin protocol. Um, And a lot of people were not thrilled with this idea. And the part that was especially not thrilling is that if that happened, the developers that had been working on Bitcoin for, for years would essentially be ousted and replaced by whatever developers were deemed fit by the companies that put together the New York agreement. And so it got massive pushback. And at the same time, miners were not agreeing to activate segregated witness, which many developers, individuals, businesses wanted to see come to fruition. 
And so the user activated soft fork gave individuals a way to run their own node and specifically only accept Bitcoin transactions if they were signaling for SegWit and allowing for that to be present on the network. And so the user activated soft fork essentially kind of gave users a voice and allowed them to move forward um, with the Bitcoin that they wanted. Later on uh, in 2017, we saw the failure of the 2x portion of SegWit2x. We saw the two megabyte block increase fail and users fully reject that both economically and through their nodes. Um, But this was what kicked it off. And seeing this activate for me made me realize that the users of Bitcoin are the ones that get to choose the consensus. And uh, it, it used a lot of interesting game theory to kind of make it so that the incentives were lined up that miners needed to activate SegWit or risk mining on a chain that would not always necessarily be supported. Um, so very interesting. There's some history behind it, but uh, to all of you out there that that weathered this storm, even if you weren't sure what was happening at the time, a very happy Bitcoin Independence Day to you. So if you'd like to read a bit about this, I found a couple articles here. um, And so it it outlines kind of what was UASF and how did it work. Um, And there's another one from before it actually went through from Jimmy Song here, and it gets a little bit more technical in its description. But I highly encourage you check both of these out. With that, let's move on to a story about one of the companies behind the SegWit2x agreement uh, that has kind of gotten the ire of Bitcoiners, uh, and myself included, over the years since that has happened. Um, now, this isn't specifically about BitPay, but essentially uh, there's new regulations in Germany that requires uh cryptocurrency related businesses to have certain licenses. And so they have actually paused operations in Germany. So if you're in Germany running a business trying to accept Bitcoin Bitcoin via BitPay, well, that's not allowed anymore. But you know what is allowed is BTC Pay Server, which is an open source alternative to BitPay. So I highly encourage you, if you are German and trying to accept Bitcoin, I would very much recommend you check out BTC Pay Server. It's totally open source and you can just run it as you please. You don't need BitPay to do this for you. Uh, So check that out. I'm not going to go too deep into this. It's just I find it interesting when... Uh, a, a regulator steps in to do something and a centralized entity is forced to uh, pause its operations or stop its operations entirely. But then you have the open source alternative that cannot be stopped, which is wonderful. That, I think that's the beauty of Bitcoin. Uh, let's move on here. Speaking of regulatory nightmares and scary things that just... I don't see necessarily working, but are a pain in the ass. Nonetheless, the IRS in Brazil is requiring people to report all Bitcoin transactions starting today. All Bitcoin transactions. Now, all. What does what does this entail? Um, well, essentially, uh, more or less everything. Are you buying something? Are you putting money onto or off of an exchange? Are you um, are you running a business that accepts Bitcoin, all of that, you know, are you an exchange in Brazil? Every single Bitcoin transaction on chain, as well as other cryptocurrency transactions, all reported. Uh, Man, this is going to be a mess of paperwork. It's insane. Um, Now, the other thing is, if you uh, have transactions um, on foreign exchanges or make peer-to-peer transactions in cryptocurrency, if they are over uh, over the course of a month, over 30,000 Brazilian re, uh, rias, uh, which is around $7,800 US, then again, that needs to be reported. Now, what are the consequences here? Uh, it kind of varies, but the charges as far as US dollars go could be between 25 and 130 US dollars, which to US residents, um, you know, doesn't seem like a ton of money, but can 
being from Brazil, it's probably a little bit harsher of a of a fine, but they're also authorized to charge between 1.5 and 3% of the amount of the unreported transaction as a penalty. Um, so I, like I look at this and I think, okay, so here, here's a full down, rundown of everything. Crypto related activities. So buying, selling, donations, barters, deposits, withdrawals, and others. So I look at that and I think, how in the hell is that even going to be possible to to keep track of, like, especially peer to peer, what are they going to be watching the blockchain and trying to, and and again, it just outlines the need for privacy, look into privacy, trying, try and keep your financial privacy about you, because this to me seems pretty draconian, every single movement of coins on the blockchain, oh my god, Uh, so yeah, unfortunate for Brazil, I, I, I wonder if something like this actually sticks because it just seems so cumbersome and and backwards. Uh, so I guess we'll see what happens moving forward. Uh, moving on here, uh, we talked about this yesterday. Bitcoin futures through Ledger X turns out didn't launch. So what happened? Well, they they were announcing that they were launching this. It's going live. Like as of, as of yesterday, they, they were saying yes, this is happening. But it it just didn't when people took a look. And so it looks like they just did not have approval from the CFTC. And so there was a little bit of confusion there. So when they submitted for for approval for the futures, essentially there's a 180 day period where the CFTC has time to respond and deny. Uh, the the approval of the the futures markets and while that that 180 days has passed and there was nothing so they filed back in November and the 180 days had passed and they said okay well we've we've heard nothing there, nothing has been done and we're we're going ahead uh, so they went to go ahead with it and the CFTC said no you that's not allowed to me that it is irritating to see that uh, things are just kind of, it, it's just like making things as slow and inconvenient as possible. But I think it maybe could have also been a, a lack of due diligence on, on the part of Ledger X. Um, so essentially things got pretty heated here. Um, there was there was a lot happening. So the updates, so essentially in a series of tweets Thursday afternoon, Ledger X CEO Paul Chu said the CFTC asked the company to censor its tweets. Uh, He threatened to sue the regulatory agency for anti-competitive behavior, breach of duty, and going against the regulations, noting that 180-day lapse, uh, as described just previously. And then beyond that, uh, earlier today, the Ledger X press representative, Ryan Gorman, told Coindesk that he will no longer be representing the company as of today over concerns about the events of the last 24 hours. So whatever is happening behind the scenes at Ledger X does not look fantastic. I understand uh, the frustration over trying to get something like this over the door and just having to wait and wait and wait. But also the it's, it seems like there's some irresponsible actions on, on the part of the, the CEO perhaps here or maybe some other people behind the scenes. Either way, no futures. They're not launching, not yet. And uh, who knows, maybe Backed will end up being the first ones out the door. But I guess we'll see. One more story here. Uh, and this is just kind of a fun piece talking about Bitcoin Lightning wallets and how they're starting to gra- gain even more traction this year. So... Um, this cites uh, a couple different wallets here. One of them is Blue Wallet, which I did a video on. Now, the thing about Blue Wallet is it's custodial with an option to be non-custodial when it comes to Lightning. So, um, you know, take that for what it is. Uh, but it also mentions other things like Zap for, uh, Zap Wallet, which is fantastic. The Lightning Labs Lightning Wallet for mobile. Um, some other ones, it cites some of the download statistics, which are, you know, tens of thousands, which is great, especially this early in the game. Um, and yeah, it also cites um, a lot of different uh, merchants and stuff starting to accept uh, Lightning transactions and uh, just the general growth of the ecosystem. So all in all, 
uh, at general, just a, a positive development. I don't know about you guys if you played around with Lightning a bunch, but it is getting easier. I did I did a video like more than a year ago, so back in spring of 2018 with some of the first mobile Lightning wallets, and while I was able to get through it, it wasn't super intuitive, and I would argue that it's still not super intuitive for some of the custodial options yet, but it is definitely getting there and is definitely improving. And it feels very reminiscent of when I first started learning about Bitcoin and trying to get a wallet on my desktop and you know downloading the entire Bitcoin blockchain for three days before I could use it compared to now where you can just get a wallet and you're good to go. Um, so it is definitely getting there and I'm encouraged by what I've seen over the past year and a bit. With that, I'm going to wrap it up, guys. Thank you very much for watching. If you're new here, a few things you can do. You can hit like, subscribe, and share. Particularly share if you like what you saw. Let people know. I'd love to have new people joining in and watching. Uh, also, if you want to help out the show in another way, feel free to hit up either of the sponsors down below, Ledin and Nord. Those links are down in the show notes. And if you really liked what you saw, you can drop a Bitcoin Lightning Network tip at my tip.me page. And with that, I am out. I will see you guys tomorrow for your daily session.